Well, I think we will go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. This is the College of Education Research uh, Colloquium. Glad to have all of you here. If you haven't been to one of these before, our uh, typical mode for, for doing these uh, colloquia is we have two presenters, and today we've got Professor Susan Bridge and Professor Judy Lysecker. They they both happen to be in the Literacy and Language Program in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction. And they're each going to take about 30 minutes to, to talk about their work uh, today. We'll do a transition after 30 minutes. We'll probably have a little time then to ask questions of Dr. Bridge. Uh, but then after both presenters are open, we've got time for some interaction and questions uh, related to both presenters. So we're happy to have both of you here. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bridge to go first. OK, thanks, Jim. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, it's a work in progress. Um, I'm going to relate this issue of coding visual data uh, in qualitative studies to a study that um, I've done uh, with Professor Shepherdson in a sheltered science classroom. So in other words, it's a classroom that enrolls only English learners. Uh, it was a seventh grade uh, classroom in a public school. And so what I'm going to look, talk about today is this whole issue of <clears throat> how you code visual data, not just verbal data. Um, now, there have, been, uh, there have been people who've done work uh, on visual data, like Sarah Pink, people like John Prosser have talked about visual ethnographies, so ways of looking at visual aspects of culture. Gunter Kress and Theo van Leeuwen have looked at um, you know, ways of reading images, but a lot of the terminology that they use is really borrowed from Halliday, which is a linguistic approach. It's kind of been slapped onto visual imagery. Uh, Jillian Rose has, look, has drawn on a number of people to look at visual analysis. Um, and she has, she has done a little bit of work on uh, using the work of Peirce uh, in semiotics, which you know, varies from Saussure's approach, which was completely verbal, uh, to, to relate that to visual imagery. But what is missing is um, ways of, code, of looking at visual nonverbal codes, using the kinds of elements and structures that are used in visual <laughs> communication. Uh, so, we know, obviously, you know, it's a visual culture. There's, you know, 200 billion images on Facebook. People are uploading, you know, 72 hours of new video every minute on YouTube. Uh, and computer science is working on visual search technologies. Otherwise, you can only search using words for things that happen to be visual. Um, we also know that, you know, textbooks even. A lot of times, as in this one, the content is communicated through the images, not the text. Here, the text just provides a frame. You know, last time you did this, now we're going to look at this. But what you're really supposed to learn about electric circuits comes from the images. Okay. So in this model of looking at visual imagery, it's not just illustration of text. And as Barbara Seals has pointed out, it's just impossible to do higher order thinking without imagery. Why? Because we start out with various kinds of experience, which then lead, formulate perceptual images. This provides the input for concept development and then language. And, you know, say Pierre, a great linguist from the 20s, said, you know, a word such as house becomes a linguistic fact only when these visual, kinesthetic, and auditory experiences are automatically associated with the image of a house. In fact, a word is really one of the most abstract ways that you can represent experience because written letters are completely arbitrary. They're not motivated signs. They're arbitrary signs. Um, so in schools, though, students are often asked in science, to use drawings. And we know that visual thinking and visual imagery is an essential part of science. Einstein conceptualized the whole theory of relativity by trying to imagine what it would be like to ride on a light beam. 
And we have the Feynman diagrams. They're used in physics. Stephen Hawking talks about how he thinks in pictures. So, uh, you know, and students will often do these kinds of drawings, but the drawings aren't really the object of the teacher's attention. What gets noticed, you know, the visual imagery just becomes kind of adjunct to the quote unquote real work of the writing. And this is something that Diane Mavers has, has recently worked with. So that the teacher's markings in the end just focus on the words that children write on the page. And one of the things Dr. Shepherdson and I have found out in our previous work <clears throat> is that very often children who are learning English have a very difficult time articulating a science concept in words, but they can demonstrate it visually quite readily. So this provides a way to then start to bring in the kind of language that goes with that imagery, but not just in terms of replicating it. Um, if we look at the work of Donald Norman, uh, who's you know worked on uh, the theory of design, he talks about a good representation and how you know a good representation isn't the same as the thing that you're representing. Otherwise, why would you need a representation? What a good representation does is to capture the essential elements of the event, deliberately leaving out the rest. So the question in terms of science learning and English learning in our classroom was, how are the students doing this? And you know, kind of what is the contribution of the curriculum to this? How visual communication is used? Uh, now, it's not really possible to um, categorize the students' visual representations in absolute terms. So undergirding all this is the standard continuum uh, that we look at in art and design, which ranges from, looks at degrees of abstraction, ranging from the very, very representational, uh, looking at things as they are, to the non-objective. In other words, you know, a visual image that is not recognizable in terms of, you know, this is a thing, this is a house, this is a horse, whatever it is. Then in the middle, we have semi-abstract and abstract forms that in different ways uh, capture these essential elements. So in a semi-abstract piece, something is represented in a <coughs> new way. It's not going to be exactly the same as the thing we're representing. In uh, an abstraction, it's just the intrinsic form. So the, as Don just calls it, the kinesthetic or the kinetic elements that we're representing. So when I talk about what the students have done here, it's on a continuum. It's not really possible to say, you know, absolutely. So now we're going to talk about the types of visual signs that we found in the students' work. And I'm going to focus on a month-long unit they did on watersheds in the seventh grade classroom. And some of these do draw on purse. So we have you know, icons, things that are highly representational. A photograph is the most representational. But what in this particular unit, which was the Lamotte Stroud kit that was used for this unit, these kinds of what I call stick-ons were provided. So these are highly iconic representations of objects. They're line drawings. But you know, they're highly representational more representational than pictographs. Uh, a lot of the students use these. Pictographs don't literally represent every single detail. They suggest the, you know, an original model. Uh, and there is a general likeness, but every single detail isn't represented. Then we have symbols, which are really non-representational. They don't look like something. All right. So an arrow, for example, would be a symbol. All right. And the students did make use of symbols too. Now, of course, in visual communication, we talk about things in terms of elements and structure. So these are the basic elements of visual signs that the students <coughs> make use of. Uh, line, and of course, diagonal lines communicate movement. 
while horizontal lines suggest stasis, more or less. Line can turn into shape, uh, and the thicker a line becomes, it can actually turn into a shape. So sometimes there is, so to speak, a thin line on the ground between a line and a shape. Then there's color or a hue. So here we have complementary colors, and of course these can be used in more or less representational ways or in more symbolic ways. So for example, using complementary colors to distinguish things as being far apart or being more opposite than they are analogous. While analogous <coughs> colors could be used to suggest a closer relationship between things. And then we have, of course, value, uh, the relative lightness or darkness of something. So we have lower values and higher values in visual representation. Then we talk about structure. All right, so how did students make use of these types of visual signs and these elements to create structures? All right, well, one of the patterns we found was that the students use pictograph symbol clusters that, are, that make use of things like shape, line, value, and sometimes written labels um, to communicate in a thematically linked way. All right. We also had pictograph clusters. All right. So there are several pictographs here. <coughs> um, and these make use of color. Obviously, here we have a more saturated color than the color of the, the river. And so here we have a factory, and the runoff is going into the river. So in these kinds of pictograph clusters, sometimes the students also used visual labels, sometimes they didn't. And the image spoke for itself. And this clearly conveys a concept uh, that relates to kind of a pop culture notion of pollution. Then there are symbol mappings. So using, making more abstract compositions that really make use of one or more visual elements, line is the principal element being used here, but also symbol. Um, sometimes written labels, you know, to represent an idea. Right. Now, there were several sources of visual language in this classroom, and then I'll, I'll show you some of the things that we actually found. Um, there was photocopied visual language, and as I mentioned, the Lamotte Stroud kit was used, and so there was photocopied visual language and photocopied verbal language that the students had access to. Right. Uh, then there was copied visual language. Okay. Now, a student drew this, but where did it come from? Right there. So it was a literal, I mean, point for point copy, you know, um, of exactly that. And the same thing happened with the verbal language. And then there's original visual language. Now this, these drawings, this series of drawings, occurred in a task that the students did where they built stream tables and made them work in order to look at a, a 3D model of a watershed. And so they, had, they went from the 3D physical model to the 2D representation on paper. Uh, and so these kinds of visual signs were created by the students based on the mental models that they were developing of watersheds based on this experience that they were having. Um, and I'll show you some of the findings on that in just a minute. So now, what I want to look at, what I want to show you are some of the, the products from two different visual assignments that the students had. Uh, and there are three categories. First, I'm going to talk about these drawings that they developed uh, in this stream table task. All right. So we had apparatus-based drawings. We had abstractions. And using Dondas' definition, that we're looking at the most essential and typical elements. Uh, being represented in the abstractions. And then there's what I call no-shows. They were extremely minimal, so non-objective, in fact, that it wasn't clear what the students understood. But there was something on the page. Uh, now, 
So here's one of the apparatus-based drawings, right? So here, what we have, this student actually moved, you know, through the task. And as you can see, what he did was to begin adding elements, principally shape, but also shape and line to show how the, water sp the watershed spread out as the water was poured through the stream table. So what he did was, and he, he just used one label here, what he did was he actually, through the visual aspects, he related really the, the apparatus more fully to the watershed. And he did show the change that was happening across here. Uh, what he did with his verbal language was uh, just to provide a physical description of what he saw happening. Um, there's much more detail in the, in the visual language that he's using. And we see really more of an attempt, and even down here he says, people messed up the whole box. Okay, so he's talking about what he did. He's not really talking about watersheds. It's over here that we begin to see that he's starting to develop a mental model of a watershed and what happens in a watershed. Uh, now here, we have another apparatus-based one. Here we have a pictograph symbol cluster, all right? And what this student does is he widens the context from the apparatus itself, which is incredibly detailed, to a broader and broader context and to the point where now that we're looking at the representation of the watershed itself, it's much more of a symbol mapping. It's less literal. He's got the essential elements here, and he's used some of the key vocabulary to label these. What he's done in the verbal language, again, is to write down what he did. What I did to get it to look like that was we did streams with the eyedropper and added water to it. Okay, again, that's what he did. That's not the science concept. So we're seeing here that he's moved from the apparatus to understand what are the components of a watershed. All right, now, this student did the opposite. Instead of widening the frame, he narrowed it. So here, again, he has a pictograph symbol cluster where he details the apparatus. But then, he's starting to use much more minimal visual language with uh, you know, pre and post labels to show the effect of the water on the land. So that when the water hits the land, this is what happens. And in other words, that's what happens as you get water flowing through the land, as, and this is what happens when a watershed forms. Now, his verbal language is actually kind of poetic. Uh, he says, dry tears of water okay, are falling. Um, and then, you know, he said, made a hole by the water, and then he says it got slimish. <laughs> so, I mean, it's very descriptive, and we can certainly move from here to some of the more technical vocabulary, but you can see from the visual language that he's, got, he's getting the concept. He's starting to develop a mental model that has to do with the effect of the water on the land. Now, if we look at some more of the more abstract uh, kinds of, of compositions that the students did. Um, we can see that um, what this student actually did was to, she, it was a 3D physical model, she took a 3D approach to representing this. So she's got dimensionality in here. What she does <coughs> is to take away the confines of this frame of the apparatus to the point where here she's got much more symbolic language where the watershed stands on its own. <coughs> so she has linked the apparatus to the watershed, but using much more minimal visual language. What did she do with her verbal language? Well, the students did this in pairs, and she just described what she and her partner did. She didn't talk about watersheds or the relationship, for example, of the tributaries to the watershed, how this formed. She just made a physical description of what she and her partner did. 
Um, now, here's the student who did much more of a symbol mapping approach. And um, so he, you know, he used line here. He used line that's sort of becoming shape here. Um, and this is almost a, what Vygotsky calls kind of a, a gestural approach. Um, because she's talking about how we put a lot of water in the box. And the teacher actually referred to the stream table as a box. Uh, and then, here's the larger representation using line and shape of the watershed. Now this representation of the river doesn't look like this representation of the river. So we would want to, now we can see something we want to talk with the student about. You know, is that link really there? Well, the verbal language, again, doesn't give us any clues about what the student really understands about watersheds. You know, we make a hole in the top. Yeah, that's what they did to make the water go through. What does this have to do with watersheds? Um, here was one of the no-shows. There were only two of these. And here, we just have a very, very, <coughs> really non-objective kind of composition. And uh, the verbal language says the white thing, it's all clear. Okay? The white thing is all wet. And the white thing, it's all wet. I put a lot of drops in, but that's why it's like that. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously here, it's both the visual language and the verbal language that you know, indicates that there's some more understanding that needs to come out of this. Nonetheless, the student has tried to represent the most essential parts of what happened in the stream table. There's just not very much context. Uh, so again, we can see there's, there's more to work on here. So although the students took all kinds of different approaches to doing this, one of the things we can see is whether the, the visual language is more or less representational. For the most part, it's the image that conveys the content and through which they're starting to try to link the stream table to this larger construct of the watershed. <coughs> and in fact, these, this original visual language did help the students to start to explore this concept of watersheds, but this wasn't transducted into their later visual products. So now I want to show you some of the uh, kinds of products we got from the final poster that the students constructed in this unit. And this was the, the closure. This was to represent, this is what I learned. And there were five types of these. Uh, and I'll go through them just really quick, quickly. Uh, first, we had the stick-ons. Half of the kids did this. And again, they did these in pairs. They just cut out this highly iconic visual language from the photocopied stuff and stuck it on. Now, these icons did differentiate the environments. So here we have a farm. Here we have the factory environment. Uh, here we have, there's more of a forest here, for example. But where did this come from? Came from photocopied visual language that they had been handed out. So we got replication. We don't have information and ideas. We have stick it on, make it look like that. And in fact, then some of the verbal language, so this one says the smoke from the factory makes the water black. The oxygen gets lower. Well, um, yeah, the smoke could add particles that might heat up. And in that case, the oxygen level would get lower. But does the student really understand that? Um, and we get other ones like this. The river turns brown because the cows poop. <laughs> the sun makes the water hot, makes it stink more. <laughs> True. But that's just a perceptual description. What does this have to do with watersheds? None of this referenced the original visual language that they used in making the stream tables. And this was much less detailed than what they had done in the stream tables. Now we have the pop culture pollution ones. 25% of the kids did this. Uh, and so what they did was to hear, it's the visual language that shows the cause and the verbal language that shows the effect. Um, and they have you know, several different environments here. Um, 
Now, it's interesting that there aren't any tributaries here because uh, this was the same student and she had shown tributaries on this model. But um, none of this previous visual information was ever referenced again by the students or the teacher, so there aren't any tributaries here. Uh, but this is where she got the visual language. And she copied the cornfield, they copied the factory, they copied the sewage treatment plant. And so here they have industrial waste, increased pH oxygen. Okay, it, that could be true. But again, where did this come from? And she's used more saturated blue here than the blue in the river. So this is the runoff that's coming off in this pictograph cluster. But here's where they got the visual language, the verbal language. Sometimes they were right, sometimes they were wrong. They just popped it on. So in other words, they borrowed the visual language, they borrowed <coughs> the verbal language, and what they understood about watersheds was borrowed from pop culture. It all had to do with the watershed as pollution. And there's a lot more to a watershed than just pollution. So none of this was really contributing to any kind of mental model other than the one that was developed by the designers of the Lamont Stroud kit. Now we have the everyday environments type. Right? Eight percent of students did this. Here we do have tributaries and things are labeled, but we have these kinds of visual stereotypes. Here, so we've got the swimming pool, we've got a park, swimming set, slide. Okay, here's where people drive into the park. And here we have more of a farm, all right? And there are some stick-ons here, some icons. So we have these pictograph clusters, but there's no relationship. What is the relationship between the environments and the water? Or back and forth? We can't see what that is. Um, and so here, you know, again, we have a situation, there's, again, there's really no reference to that original visual language that they did. Um, the, the, the mental model here really doesn't relate to watersheds at all. It's just scenes by the water. Now we have the Godzilla model. And uh, these are highly iconic pictographs. Obviously, they're not, cop they're not from the photocopied visual <laughs> language from the kit. Uh, they are from... Uh, the Dragon Ball manga. Here we got Godzilla from Rampage video game. So we got Steel Titan, that's from a wiki. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of really interesting visual language. Uh, but let's look at this. When he dies, all his blood goes to the river. Okay? Same sentence here, really. When he poops, the poop goes in the water. Okay. Uh, had another Dragon Ball guy. Got Stewie from <laughs> Sam and Guy. <laughs> okay. Uh, so really, the river is a minimal part of this whole, you know, kind of constellation. Uh, the relationship to a watershed is tangential at best. Uh, and so really, there hasn't been any development of that mental model that was started with the original visual language. Now I have the water park type, what they call the love ride. Uh, and here we do have shape used as a central visual element. But the icons here, neither the icons nor, nor some, there's some symbols used here. Uh, they don't differentiate the environments like we had in the stick-ons. Uh, because, and see here we have the verbal language is welcome to the love ride, and then all of the environments are the same, basically. So, uh, what we really have here is kind of, you know, the visual language is fantasy land, the verbal language is fantasy land. Uh, this is all self replicative. So, yeah, there were things on the page, and there was water. There were visual things, but again, no mental model of watersheds is really being developed. So if we look at the kinds of tasks that occurred across this unit, you can see how much of it was copied and photocopied 
and how much of it was original. There was really, there wasn't very much original visual language. There was only one time and when they really used that original visual language. Uh, what ended up happening, what we found was that um, it was that language that, as I said, that worked towards the, the mental model. Um, but all of these things that were copied and photocopied just relied on the kinds of everyday understandings that they already had. No science was added. The only language that was added were some of these labels, like tributary, headwater, mouth. Uh, most of the verbal language that was used really didn't relate to watersheds. Um, there were mental models being developed, not about watersheds. Uh, only 25% of the products really showed any understanding of watersheds, and that related completely on the negative impacts of watersheds. There was nothing that had to do about leaving areas natural as a choice, the effect of that on the water, the effect of the upstream on the downstream. Yes, there were tributaries, but what does that do? Um, and so the copied and photocopied visual language was just used for replication. So what we had here was very little science learning, very little language learning. The use of visual communication was really very poor. It's not that the teacher shouldn't have done this, but it should have been done in quite a different way. I mean, even the, even the stream table task. What if the drawings had been used to have the students design what they think this would look like? And then use those visual models to then build a stream table, test it out, and see how that would work. So we can only see all of this, though, by looking at the visual language that the students produced. We can't really tell very much by just looking at the words they wrote. So that's why you know, I'm trying to make this system more and more visual, because images aren't illustrations of words, and words aren't explanations of images. The modes don't duplicate each other, and that's why there are different modes. So how to bring this in, and especially the fact that you know, if we're not addressing visual communication in the classroom, we're going to lose the kids, because it's a visual culture. And there are ways to read visual images that both teachers and students you know, need to be consciously aware of. That's all I have to say.